Show me the crypto. <laughs> Show me the crypto. <laughs> Show me the crypto. In a world on the brink of disruption, two men will bring you clarity by interviewing some of the most intelligent and influential names in the blockchain world. Welcome to Show Me the Crypto with your hosts, Wade Patterson and Ulf Lonegren. Well, hi there and welcome to Show Me the Crypto. My name is Wade Patterson. And I'm Ulf Lonegren. We're a couple of friends from Canada who love learning about cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, and we're happy you're along for the ride. Whether you're a crypto virgin or you know your way around the block, we hope our interviews with some of the most intelligent and influential people in the space help deliver you with value. And on this episode, we're joined by multidisciplinary artist, People Pleaser. While some dream of making it on the cover of Fortune magazine, People Pleaser literally made the August-September cover of Fortune magazine. And what started with making cool DeFi-related animation videos quickly propelled People Pleaser's reputation, and in January of this year, Uniswap approached her to create a video for their V3 launch. The video was auctioned off as an NFT, and the bidding war was won by a quickly formed DAO, appropriately named Pleaser DAO, which paid 310 ETH for the piece, all of which was donated to charity. People Pleaser, welcome to Show Me the Crypto. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. I'm stoked, Thanks stoked that you're on this episode. And so I want to talk about an op-ed that you did for Fortune. And you wrote that one year ago, you were at one of your lowest points in life. Can you walk us through like the long form story? Like how has crypto changed your life over the last year? Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, I was working sort of in visual effects and uh, 3D animation and and for probably like six years, ever since I graduated college. And then, um, you know, like it's a tough industry. Like it's sort of one that's been, I don't know if you guys know about like everything that happened with Life of Pi, for example. Um, so, you know, there was like this whole visual effects strike because uh, Life of Pi actually uh, ended up winning the Oscar for best visual effects. But um, because the sort of traditional like Hollywood visual effects industry is such an like abusive one. So um, oftentimes like visual effects companies have to really, really sort of like cut um, their costs and everything to like win bids with, you know, major Hollywood, you know, movies and stuff. And so basically what happened was even though they won um, the best um, visual effects Oscar, which is a huge nod to their work, uh, the studio that um, mainly did the visual effects actually ended up going bankrupt before they even won the award, uh, which is crazy. crazy. And then, like, you know, when I think, you know, when like Ang Lee was doing the stage, like nobody even, anyway, it was just like this, basically this time, but, um, you know, and so this is just a little backstory on how, like, you know, kind of just like, uh, it's so difficult to actually, you know, and many people who work in visual effects know this, that you have to change jobs um, very frequently because usually it's just by contract. And then, you know, you work really long hours and it's not super well paid. And then at the end of it, uh, you always have to find a new gig and it's often maybe not in the same city. So it's just like a pretty tough industry in general. So anyway, around, um, you know, sort of like the end of 2019, I was coming to the end of a contract and then uh, I was uh, sort of really looking for a new gig, essentially. And then, you know, it actually took me a few months, I think like three months before I actually landed another one, which was a, to be a digital artist at Apple. Mm -hmm. And so this would be around March of 2020. And finally, you know, I got um, the news that I had gotten an offer. And I was like, phew, you know, don't have to worry about future anymore. And then... Uh, sometime in April, I mean, obviously this is when the pandemic started kicking in and because I'm actually not American. And so uh, they had to like work on getting me a visa. And then, you know, when the pandemic started, the USCIS basically just shut down. <laughs> and then so uh, sometime in April, they had to call me and be like, uh, we're not sure about the state of your visa application right now, but basically we can't give you an offer anymore because of everything that's going on. And then so, you know, what I thought was a huge relief turned into, uh, I have to look for a job again. 
And this was also when I just sort of moved into my own apartment in New York as well, because I thought that I'd gotten the job. So I was like, oh, I don't have to live in Brooklyn with like three other roommates anymore. I can get my own apartment. It was just a really small studio, you know, but, and then, you know, when I got the news, I was really worried and stressed about paying my bills. And I mean, it was tough actually. So, um, you know, I don't think that, I think it was just a really tough time to be searching for jobs in general. You know, I think anybody, there were a lot of people who lost their jobs during the pandemic and everything. So anybody who sort of like went through that would understand that it was just very, very difficult. And so, yeah, during this time, you know, I was applying to every single job that I could find a bunch of them that don't even fit, you know, what I'm doing. But I was just like any job, you know, I need income. Um, And, you know, I just, I just didn't, land any of them sometimes i would get through you know all the rounds of interviews past the final the, to the final round only to be let down at the very end and i remember uh, around this time i my, my parents are like so supportive and everything so you know they, they were sort of like my only pillars of strength during this time where i would call them and ask oh is it because i'm not talented or capable enough you know am i ever going to jo- get a job again i actually at this point i actually had a thought that what if I just never, ever get a job again, you know? And then so throughout this whole summer, I was just continuing to look for jobs. And uh, I think being sort of type A myself, um, I was also putting a lot of pressure on myself to sort of, you know, just be doing things in life. And then so, you know, while I'm not working, uh, just to make myself feel like I'm more productive or at least not literally wasting life, um, I started my Instagram art account and then... So that's how the name People Pleaser was born. Uh, I was just, I was just looking, you know, I was looking around Instagram and seeing all these um, individual freelance uh, digital artists were just posting their work on Instagram, and then a lot of them had really cool artist names, and you know, my regular name is kind of boring, so I thought that I should get a cool artist name as well. And my personality, uh, by nature, is just I have a hard time saying no to people, and I always try to meet the expectations of people around me. And then, so I just thought that, you know, it was one of those moments where I'm just creating an account and then I don't want to, I've already started the process. So I don't want to like put it down and actually think about a name. I was like, oh my, well, my personality is kind of like a people pleaser. So I'm just going to call it people pleaser. And then I wanted to do the cool hipster thing, you know, where you don't have any vowels. (laughs) So it was supposed to be like PPL, PLSR, but then that one was taken. (laughs) And so the reason why it's spelled so weird, which I think Crypto Twitter still hates to this day because usually people are always spelling it wrong. They're like, why is this spelled in such a weird way? And honestly, it's just because I started adding vowels back into the name until it wasn't taken. (laughs) And so that's literally why it's spelled so weird. And then, so then I created my account and then just to pass time, you know, I would sort of brush up on my generalist skills as well and just practice and make art. And then uh, you know, to no avail, I was still unsuccessful at getting a job around, you know, during, throughout the entire summer, really. And then uh, sometime in August, basically, one of my friends uh, sort of texted me. So my background with crypto was, um, you know, I knew about Bitcoin and Ethereum or not Ethereum, but mainly Bitcoin when I was in college. But then, you know, I didn't have money back then. And then so in 2017, uh, I made the rookie mistake of thinking, you know, this is when I first started saving some money from like working and I wanted to invest. And then I made the, so I basically was on Reddit a lot. And then I discovered the cryptocurrency subreddit and I thought, oh, well, this is how I should um, invest my money. But then, you know, I made the rookie mistake of thinking, oh, Bitcoin, Ethereum are kind of expensive. So I'm going to look for the next Bitcoin or the next oh, yeah. gen. Just, been there, been there. <laughs> exactly, right? Like I just threw my money at all the 2017 ICO shit coins and then just thought, oh, one of these must stick. And then I actually diamond hands these all the way throughout the bear market too. Um, and then so anyway, in 2020, when DeFi summer really kicked off, my friend who is in crypto, uh, or, you know, he's really sort of like involved in it or active in it, um, texted me and he's like, dude, I'm making, you know, X amount of dollars um, just farming tokens right now. You got to check this out. There's crazy stuff happening in crypto right now. So I was like, oh my gosh, what is it? And the, that's when I discovered crypto Twitter. So then he basically showed me crypto Twitter. He's like, look, everybody's on Twitter. Um, and then so, you know, that, that was my first um, exposure to crypto Twitter. And I was like, this is awesome. I mean, it's kind of like the same culture as the subreddit, but you know, crypto Twitter is even, obviously they get the information faster and everything. And then I also noticed that 
uh, everybody was promoting things like all these like DeFi things were promoting through memes and stuff. And it was all these like a low effort memes. And so I was just joking to my friend. I was like, oh, since I'm so desperate for a job or, you know, any sort of income, they should totally just hire me to do promotional content for them. And then my friend being very sweet, uh, actually remembered this. And then, so when, uh, they saw basically Blue Kirby at the time make out a tweet saying, oh, is there anybody who's really good at video editing or something? And then so my friend actually sent Blue Kirby my Instagram profile, the art Instagram. And then Blue Kirby saw it and he's like, oh, dude, your art is awesome. We should do something together. And then so I made my first animation for Wi-Fi. And I remember this was my first exposure. So I created a crypto um, Twitter, like a Twitter account purely for this. And then this was my first exposure to DeFi at the time, you know, when Wi-Fi was like hitting new peaks. And I remember Blue Kirby was like, do you take YUSD? And I was like, what is this? And <laughs> like, all this new terminology that was being thrown at me. And I just had no idea what was going on. And I would pretend to understand, but then like ask my friend on the side, be like, what does this mean? <laughs> um, so, you know, it was a fast learning curve. And then, but um, I found that so yeah, that, that was my first animation that I had ever made, which actually never ended up gracing crypto Twitter because um, for the, I think it was for one of their YF vaults. And then um, there was some like delay with the vault or something. So then the video ended up never being like shown. So it's funny because my Genesis crypto animation ever, people on crypto Twitter have never seen. And I think maybe one day I'll reveal it because I really like that one. So yeah. Um, Sounds and, ultra rare. <laughs> <laughs> very rare. And then, so that was my sort of, yeah, introduction to DeFi. And then you guys, I don't know, probably know the rest. It just, you know, one by one through word of mouth, you know, I then did one for pickle finance. So that was the blue, the blue pickle video was actually the first uh, one that, you know, sort of graced crypto Twitter. And I remember it was cool just when they posted it. I think it was the first time that there was sort of a, higher quality like animation or you know promotional content thing um in DeFi. so then it like shocked crypto twitter everybody was like oh my god what is this like who made this and then i thought it was i thought that was nice and then you know it was like the first time i was getting some recognition for my work and also that i was just getting paid a little bit to you know survive and stuff and so i thought this was great and i could learn about DeFi at the same time it was just all very fascinating to me um, my dad sort of like being on the, sitting on the sidelines, watching all this happen. He later described it as like, he felt like just like the cover image of my fortune magazine, uh, artwork. Like it was as if like I had gotten a glimpse or like a window of what this world was like, um, of the rabbit hole of like DeFi and everything. And, uh, I stepped right in because I didn't have anywhere else to go. And yeah, I mean, now we're here. <laughs> you started at, uh, that that intro of uh you know getting in with wi-fi i mean you you go back further to your story about uh you're getting into all these shit coins and holding all diamond hands but none of them ended up panning out in this case it was kind of like the opposite you got in with a great project at a great time and i mean it could have been another random shit coin project but uh yeah. you know wi-fi has uh, got lots of great uh notoriety and credibility behind them and yeah yeah definitely. I was, I, I'm very lucky. Um, awesome. Well, let's take a, you know, you just gave us a great summary of, you know, kind of getting to where you got to, to that point. But what if we take a step further back and we just talk about art in general, you know, have you always been an artist? Uh, where did that passion come from? And, and, and what's the story there? Yeah, I think I, I had always, I don't know if it's, you know, you're born this way or something, but I'd always been, I guess, I guess, artistic. Um, you know, I've been doodling ever since I can remember. And I think my parents noticed this. And then so, um, and I remember even in elementary school and stuff often, you know, not to sort of like toot my own horn, but it's, <laughs> I'm just saying it as like a fact, which is like my parents were telling me that every art teacher um, that I've ever had was usually like, oh, you should send your daughter to art school or something. But then, you know, my parents are pretty Asian. And then so... They're just like, oh, you should just do like, you know, normal people things like math or whatever. Um, and then, but, you know, when I was applying to college, uh, my dad thought, okay, well, at the very least, maybe, or not my dad, my parents were, oh, maybe at the very least you can combine like art and math and physics 
and then maybe do like architecture or something. And so I applied to a bunch of architecture programs. And then like after I'd sent out all the applications, my dad called me one day and he's like, actually, apparently like my friends who have kids who go to architecture school are just suffering. Like they often go like three to four days without sleeping or something. And apparently it's just like not a good career move. So don't do it. And I was like, okay, well, literally the only school that I had left that I didn't apply to architecture for was UCLA. And so that's where I ended up going to college. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had always been, I guess, an artistic person. Um, you know, I drew, I, I, I was, you know, drawing and illustrating a lot when I was younger. Uh, I think it sort of fizzled out more through my like middle high school days because I was more focused on academics during that time. And then I kind of rediscovered it again in college when I watched Wally during my freshman year of college. And then I was like, this is the best movie ever. Um, and then I saw, you know, all those names at the end of the movie um, in the credits. And then I thought, oh my gosh, there's so many names here. There's no reason why I can't just be one of them. And then so I literally went online and Googled, how do I get a job at Pixar? And then people were like, well, first you need to understand like 3D softwares and stuff. And so, you know, you need to know these things. And yeah, I just started, basically I'm self-taught. So I just started learning it outside of class. Um, and then after three years, I applied for a job and got one and then started working. That's so awesome. And and so one of the big things you mentioned, some of these early projects that you got involved with in the DeFi space, but the the big one I mentioned about the, the Uniswap V3 video so how did that all come about? And I know this story, you, you've told it on other interviews, but if you don't mind for the benefit of our audience, just kind of walking them through what happened there. For sure. So in basically in January, Uniswap had reached out to Tarun Chitra asking if uh, they could get through him, get in contact with me because uh, they wanted to talk about a collaboration. And then so, uh, you know, when I, when we, came in contact and they were like, oh, do you want to do the V3? Or we were thinking of, you know, um, basically doing some animations for like V3 launch or something. And I was like, you know, anybody who's been in DeFi knew how big of a deal V3 was. So I was like, wait, really? Me? You're going <laughs> to let me do this? And then um, I think that was sort of when I really wanted to take this very seriously because I knew that there were going to be a lot of eyeballs on this um, animation. And also because... Uh, before, I think a lot of the projects that I had done previously or the videos, the timeline was a lot shorter because it's such a fast moving space, right? But, you know, as we all know, Uniswap really took their time to prepare for the V3 announcement. And so, um, including this one, you know, they, they budgeted like a very, very generous amount of time for planning this animation and everything. Um, and so, you know, I felt like I had enough time to do something uh, more ambitious. And then, so I think I just set out to be, I just wanted it to be artistic, cool, trippy. Um, and, you know, obviously I think, you know, including symbolisms and Easter eggs had always been actually a frequent theme in all of my videos. Um, it wasn't just the Unisop thing. I think that's, you know, when a lot of people knew about my work, but it, it actually is in all of my pieces. Um, and then so, yeah, you know, just kind of taking my normal playbook really and then just sort of expanding that because I had more time and a little bit more budget to do it. And um, yeah, I just tried to make it as cool as possible. The whole process took about uh, at least a month and a half to complete. And then I also hired two uh, friends to help me with sort of, uh, various sort of like animation tasks um, because it was, you know, more like it was up until that point, I had been doing everything myself, but, um, you know, because this was a little bit more ambitious of a project and also just to save time, um, you know, I got some help, which is really great. And uh, I think, yeah, I mean, when I finished the video, and they tweeted it out. I was so nervous, um, but you know, sort of like literally just refreshing the page, and then immediately had like a thousand likes. Um, I mean, honestly, though, you know, it was such a highly anticipated event. I think everybody was just waiting for V three at any moment. Um, then, so I think you know, even if they had tweeted out literally just a random picture, it probably would have gotten a lot of engagement. Uh, so I'm not going to take all the credit for my animation. No, 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 no. It was the quality. It was the quality of the animation. Too. <laughs> it is super high quality though. And yeah. like, it, there's a, there's a bit of a, like, yeah, you know, there's a story to it. Can you, can you 
uh, for our audience, I know we don't have some we'll people might it. be we'll listening. It, yeah. We will link to it. But can you maybe explain the the story or like the storyboard, if you will, for what takes place throughout the video? Yeah. So the um, basically the conversation kicked off with Khalil, who is uh, I think the lead designer at Uniswap. He's amazing. And then it was just. So on my uh, art Instagram, um, you know, I, I started doing a lot of tune shading stuff, which was um, largely inspired by Mobius. I don't know if you guys know who he is, but he's like a very, very famous French artist, um, uh, concept or illustrate illustrator artist. Um, he does a lot of. He's basically like the godfather of all things sci-fi. Like he did a lot of early concept art for like Star Wars and dune and all this kind of stuff super cool style like very unique and then so my tune shading method kind of was really inspired by that and then when i was talking with khalil from unisop he was like you know i really love mobius um you know what if we and i was like say no more literally that's what my instagram art like is inspired by and everything and then so um that's where sort of the style and aesthetic came about and then the story itself was very much, um, I think, developed um, during the process or like through time. And then, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the main story of the animation piece itself is just that basically before Uniswap had entered the game, you know, with their decentralized exchange, I think DeFi was, or not even DeFi, but just crypto in general was a little bit more, you know, dull and mundane. And then so, you know, when DeFi kicked in and really just, kickstarted a whole other movement and everything. And so uh, it's basically just this concept of the unicorn coming in and bringing life and color to this um, otherwise desolate land. And then, you know, there's all these DeFi imagery and elements, you know, like a MetaMask box popping out and everything. Um, and then the sort of noodles or the pasta looking things in the um, video represent the bonding curves, uh, which for a, Basically, you know, one of the biggest features of V3 is that you can select your own uh, range for providing liquidity. And then so that's sort of what those uh, bonding curves represent. You know, the piece itself is called X times Y equals K, which is the uh, equation uh, that Uniswap uses to um, determine the price of any asset. And um, I don't know, there's like, you know, some Miyazaki references in there. And then at the end, you know, sort of, the unicorn and the noodles kind of find the Ethereum promised land. And then you look up at the sky and it ends on a cliffhanger because it's like V3, but it's not super obvious. You know, it's like in the stars or like V3 is on the horizon because they were actually announcing it the day after they posted that video. Right. And so, yeah, that's just the general concept. And, and so how did it feel when you realize that this group of people on the internet were forming a quick DAO um, for the purpose of purchasing the NFT. And not only are they doing that to purchase something you created, but they literally name it Please or Dow after you. Like what, what's going through your mind at that point? I had heard about something like this forming, but I didn't, first I didn't know. I didn't know it was going to be called Please or Dow until they actually had placed their first bid on Foundation, which was I think like maybe within the last hour of the auction or something. And then so before that, I had just heard of like Jameis, I think, um, who's now the CPO of Please or Dow, like DM me saying, hey, I think a few of us are, you know, putting together a DAO or something. And then I had saw some tweets here and there, you know, like from Leighton and people on Twitter, um, you know, sort of chattering about it. And then, I mean, that day also, I was I, I was actually with my parents and they were um, going to a talk, you know, I'm totally unrelated to this. So I was kind of like, you know, busy, like out and about too. So I couldn't really focus, but um, I knew that this stuff was happening and it kind of blew my mind. You know, I previously didn't even never even thought that it was possible that multiple people can come together and you know own a piece but at the same time it also made sense because i was like you know this v3 announcement was going to be such a big deal and obviously a lot of people are going to see this video it's so weird to me that one person would like own the video you know what i mean like and so you know something that's like made for the community it actually just made so much sense if a lot of people came together and owned it and then so you know, in my head, I was obviously secretly rooting for this to happen. But at the same time, you know, they didn't, you know, they didn't tell me like what was happening and they didn't place their bid until, you know, the last hour of the auction, which is obviously a very big brain strategic move. Um, and then so I, at, at some point, I thought that it wasn't happening anymore. But then I think when they placed their first bid and then, you know, you saw that it was like, please are down. 
Um, yeah, I, I honestly, I was so touched that I, I cried or I shed a tear. And then, so, um, the selfie that I posted, uh, of me, like with a tear was actually, it wasn't taken after the sale had ended. It was when I think Pleaser Dow first made their first appearance because oh, wow. you know, it was just so touching to me that all these people came together to support my work. I don't know. It's it's hard to describe. It was a very special moment. And then so, yeah, actually it was most touched because of that and not because the piece ended up selling for a lot or anything. It was just the fact that people would come together and form a DAO, you know, just to support my work was, I, I was just speechless at the time. So I'm so incredibly lucky. Ulf, do you realize our audience has been either watching or listening to this episode for 20 minutes? 20 minutes? No, they should probably subscribe. Yeah, they should subscribe. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you comment and turn on notifications. And if you're listening to this podcast, especially if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating and a review. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and even TikTok. So go check out the episode description. You can find all that information below. And we have an update on the NFT, don't we? That's right. We didn't previously mention this, but this NFT for OG supporter is a one of one. There will only be one of this kind ever minted. And we have a few surprises for the person who purchases it. The link is in the episode description. And back to the episode. That's amazing that, uh, you know, I can't help but feel like, I mean, who wouldn't be touched? You had a DAO formed that has your <laughs> pseudonym that you came up with on the spot when you were creating an Instagram account mm -hmm. one day representing you and here people come together to buy your artwork and support you. Um, yeah, that, that's just awesome. And uh, I think it, it is touching. So, so fair enough to shed a tear, <laughs> but, um, uh, speaking to the NFT and the sale, you, as Wade mentioned in the bio, you donated the full amount to charity. Why was that important to you? I think, you know, um, first, because of just being, having gone through that really stressful summer of not having, you know, sort of like a job or income and then sort of watching like a bull run, you know, but obviously every crypto bull run is like this. People make money so quickly and everything, but to me, it just felt um, it was wrong if I, or just, you know, this is around that this is in March too. So it was after we had seen some NFT explosions already in January and February. Right. And then um, I had a feeling that if I was going to make a lot of money from NFTs uh, for some reason, I just, was a hunch that, uh, well, first, honestly, uh, even before I was, let's say, more well known, um, I had always thought, oh, what if I just did, you know, one or two small pieces, like small sales where um, the NFT proceeds go towards a charity or something? I just thought that that would be cool because basically I'm not super, I wasn't like very wealthy at that time to donate any meaningful amounts of money like myself. But, uh, you know, if I was able to generate a lot of, uh, you know, revenue from NFT sales, which were literally going through the roof at the time, then um, that would be something that would be meaningful to me, right? And um, and literally right before this happened, you can find this on my Twitter too. This was around the time when all the Asian hate stuff was going on. And then um, I think there was that shooting in Atlanta that happened. And then I had seen an Instagram post from one of the victim's sons where he just posted this really, really sad um, Instagram post saying like, he's so angry that, you know, this happened to his mom, like he doesn't know what to do. And, you know, that this world is just very unfair. And I felt so just, you know, empathetic when I read that and everything. I, I remember I sent, cause I think he had his Venmo, um, information on the Instagram profile. So I sent him a hundred dollars and then, but I was just thinking, man, this is just, you know, a hundred dollars is just not very meaningful. And then, so that's when I got the idea about the Uniswap NFT sale. I mean, I had always, it was always meant to be for charity, but I didn't know which charity I was going to right. give it to. And then, so that was when I had the idea, well, um, I, why not donate it to a cause, you know, that I care about as well, which is around this time when all this Asian hate crime was happening. And then, so, you know, it didn't, it wasn't ended up uh, uh, going to one charity per se. I actually ended up creating a fund. It's called the Stand With Asians Community Fund, um, you know, in joint collaboration with Uniswap. And then we actually picked out 24 different uh, charities or nonprofit organizations to each give out $25,000 grants to 
And we still have leftover in the fund. And what's really even cooler is that this fund is now sort of like a self-sustaining thing and it's been passed down to. So afterward, James Jean, who was a, another really, really famous artist, um, he basically reached out to me saying that he is interested in donating um, some of his NFT um, money towards the same fund. And then so, and then, and then even after that, um, the art art director at, um, of Overwatch at Blizzard also did the same thing with one of his NFT mm -hmm. films. So now it's been passed through like three different artists. Um, and then it's also open to the public. So anybody can donate. And then the beauty of it is that it's all in the blockchain. So it's all, you know, transparent for people to see. Um, so yeah, that was really cool. It's so cool to see like in a year, like one year, like the progression, right? Like so many things happen and that, you know, the fact that you're able to do that, such a meaningful, I mean, the hundred dollars is meaningful, like absolutely. But then just through your art, the amount that it raised and everything along those lines, it's such a cool story. I, I want to switch gears here and talk a little bit about the, the fortune magazine cover art. So just hold it up again for our audience. So First off, how did this opportunity come about? And second question is, is kind of what is the meaning? Just like you walked us through the V3 video meaning, what's the meaning behind the imagery there? Yeah, so um, do you guys know Alex Mazmej? Um, yeah. The founder we, of Showtime. We had, him, we had him on our show for an episode. He was awesome. So yeah. Oh, awesome. I got to watch that one. Um, yeah, he's great. So he reached out to me one time. Um, and saying he, he was like, hey, like some people at Fortune were interested in getting in contact with you. Would you be interested in being connected? And I said, yeah, sure. But then, you know, sort of nothing really came about that, I think, for a few months later. But I think it was just like Fortune didn't really know what they wanted to do yet. Um, and, you know, at the time also, I was like, oh, if it's just going to be another one of those like random NFT projects or something, you know, I would be less interested. And then, yeah, so a few months went by, nothing really happened. And then one day I just get a cold email from the creative director at Fortune, Peter Herbert. He just goes, I think the title is just like Fortune cover or something. And he just goes, hey, people pleaser, like, you know, we're huge fans of your work. The Unisop uh, video was really cool. Um, would you be interested in doing the cover for our next issue? Because we're I'm actually making a special issue covering cryptocurrency and DeFi. And then we thought that you'd be a great fit for it. And then when I read it, I was like, it was like the same thing as the Unisop V3. <laughs> like, really? Me? Like you want me to do a cover? And then, so then I went into the pressure mode again, where I'm like, oh, there's going to be a lot of eyes on this. Like I need to make it perfect. Um, and I was really struck. And, and, you know, we, we jumped on a few calls and, you know, they're so nice and, you know, it's just so open to letting me do whatever I want. Um, they were, and then, um, you know, but I was, I was putting a lot of pressure on myself. So, you know, I, I, I'm the kind of person where if I don't get that really, you know, the idea that I think would really work, then it's very hard for me to execute. You know, if I don't get that spark or like the aha moment or something, then, um, you know, it's just, like so, yeah, so the sort of brainstorming process went on for a really long time where I was like, okay, they want me to do this cover, but what even is the cover going to be? And then, you know, Leighton Cusack, who obviously is the person who kicked off the tweet about starting Peter Dow, once again saved my life um, by I remember we were I was chatting and then we were uh, we were chatting and then I was telling him about my uh, fortune woes where I was like, oh, I have no ideas for this cover and stuff. And then, uh, he literally texted me the next day. He was like, Hey, I went home yesterday night and I was just thinking about your cover. And, you know, I got this idea. Uh, what if you just, you know, did something along the lines of having like a rabbit hole or like a portal. And then inside were just all these like crypto anonymous Twitter people. And then he was like, I think, you know, like people would really love that. And then I was like, you're literally a genius. <laughs> so all credit to him for that idea, really. Um, but then, you know, obviously it was up to me to figure out how I was even going to, you know, sort of depict this and everything. And so, um, you know, the, then there was that, there was a whole process there where I was going back and forth, you know, coming with different versions that I didn't like. Um, you know, I also uh, referenced, not referenced, but yeah, looked at some of the past covers of the um, recent Fortune magazine issues. And then, you know, I still wanted it to be sort of within that same, not same, but similar sort of, you know, taste and style, but also adding my own touch to it. But honestly, you know, that, that was a very, very stressful few weeks. But 
Um, I think it came out great. Like I am personally happy with how it came out. And it seems like so is the rest of crypto Twitter. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just I'm I'm really glad that that came out nicely. I love the concept. I'm just like looking at it here at the same time. But uh, I love the concept because Wade and I, you know, we're interviewing people who are involved in the crypto space. And one of the questions we inevitably ask constantly, we don't always put it this way, but we ask like, you know, what was you know, what was your, what got you into crypto? We might say, you know, what was your like rabbit hole or what was your, uh, you know, you know, what was your, um, gateway drug or something like that. But we we've mentioned, I know we've mentioned the term rabbit hole many times because that's what it is. Like yeah. once you start, once, once you get just like dip your toes in all of a sudden this whole like world opens up and it's yeah it's a crazy thing so it's it really was a great idea and you executed it awesomely thank you yeah i think anybody you know all of us who went through the same thing of discovering the crypto you know rabbit hole it's literally the, yeah we all understand that's literally the only way you can put it or it's like a portal or something i don't know it's a very magical experience for sure so yeah i tried my best to sort of um, translate that into an image, you know. <laughs> and then was it, so along with the cover art, there was also an NFT sale and that kind of, how, how did that, like, I know it was successful, but like, like, what was the, like, what was the drop? Like how many were there? How quickly did it sell? What was the top price for those types of things? Yeah. So the drop itself was an addition of 256, right. um, who, uh, credit to Tarun Chitra for coming up with that number when he said it I was like, oh, duh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So good. And then, so yeah, um, you know, I, I, I like basically when Fortune first brought up that, oh, we could also, because you know how Time also did something similar where mm -hmm. they were selling their covers as NFTs and with then, the Winklevoss twins on it or something like that? Or was that I a different one? That one, they also did one with people. And then I oh, think right. they also did ones of, like really old covers or something. Okay, but, yeah. you know, I was just, I'm always sort of like a somebody who wants to try something new or, you know, be a little bit more creative. So I was like, okay, I don't want to just drop the cover, you know, just like that. And so how can we make this a little bit more interesting and crypto native? And so first we came up with the number. Well, I had originally just brought up to Fortune. I said that, you know, instead of trying to go for the ultra high value one of ones, like, I want, because this is going to be something that elevates the community and hopefully resonates with everybody in the community, I want it to be a little bit more affordable and that more people can have, like, have, get their hands on one instead of just there being a one of -on one, right? And then so, um, so that concept was settled pretty early. And then we decided on the number and then the price. So it was one Ethereum each, 256 editions. And then on top of that, there was a separate um, three one of ones where, mm -hmm. Uh, I partnered with Manifold who are um, creating NFT smart contracts. And uh, basically they helped me do this really cool thing where uh, I brought up the idea because the cover, you know, was featuring a lot of like different famous, you know, crypto influencers. And then so, I, and a lot of their uh, wallet addresses are public. Right. And then, so I was thinking, Oh, it's just an experiment. I didn't even know how it would go. I didn't tell any of them that this was going to happen. And then, so in the smart contract, we would target their wallet addresses. And so if any of them bid, um, then there would be a different version actually of the animation to feature the specific, you know, targeted, uh, let's say avatar or influencer. So, you know, example, like Loom Dart or the crypto dog, like, um, it's funny because I mean, I, I, I totally expected this to happen. Like most of them didn't end up bidding because you know, they didn't even know that this was going to happen. I didn't, I also didn't tell them that, the, but, you know, obviously I announced in my video, but it was like, um, so, you know, there was a lot of the versions that I made that just never saw the light of day. I might post them on Twitter one day or something just for the walls. You know, I think it's funny. <laughs> like, the one with crypto dog is like him, like driving, like the dog, like driving in a Lambo, like across Crazy. the cover. Uh, yeah. So there's like a different version for every single one of these. Um, and, um, I, it was just something cool and new, you know, I don't think anybody had ever done this before with like targeted bidding. Um, so yeah, that was basically the nature of the drop. The 256 editions sold out within like, I don't know, two minutes or something, <laughs> um, like sold out right away. Yeah. And then immediately like the floor went into like four ETH. 
they're now sitting around like, I think between like 10 and 15. At a high point, they were like 23 ETH for, which is crazy. Um, and yeah, so I mean, overall, me and Fortune had raised over 1.3 million um, for the entire NFT sale, uh, which of course, being um, sort of like my brand and ethos, um, I had established with them that 50% of that would go to charity. So and amazing. So still, I'm in the process of, you know, because it's like people are like, oh, charity, it's not like a one day process, you know, like with a Uniswap one, you know, we spent like, I think two months or something after, you know, figuring out which like finalizing, researching what charities to give to. And so, so now I'm going through that process again with Fortune you know, people, I didn't run off the with the money or anything. Like it's obviously an ongoing process that people don't understand that there's actually a lot of time and effort that needs to be put into um, this entire like research and everything. And so, yeah, I'm doing that right now. And hopefully, you know, when that's all settled, we can tell Twitter uh, sort of, but I mean, for sure, they're all going to be, I think, uh, like journalism related charities, um, Mm -hmm. which I think is really cool. Um, and something that Fortune stands by. So yeah, nice. On the on the topic of Fortune, they also featured an inaugural uh, Nifty Fifty, <laughs> and uh, and you were sandwiched between Mark Cuban and Jay Z in the number five <laughs> spot. So first off, how did it feel to be sandwiched between <laughs> those two? Um, yeah, well, we can start there. I mean, it's funny. Because I I don't really like know that that was going on you know I was just so occupied with doing the cover and everything that that was just such a busy month honestly and I felt bad because I think I remember one one morning when the the list came out because it came out with the digital issue too so that was the same day that my cover came out as well and then I remember Peter sent over the links and he was like by the way you should check out the list because you're on it and then I think I I obviously saw it and I was like, oh my God, thanks. But I didn't give like a very detailed reply or reaction because I was just so um, occupied with just the whole cover, um, and, you know, for because we had to deliver the still version and then there's an animated version, right? Mm-hmm. So the animated version is going to be the NFT. And then on top of just the standard animated version, I had to do all the different versions for each, like, you know, right. or whatever. So it was like after I had sent out the still version, um, you know, everyone was going crazy, like, oh my God, this is great. But I was still working, you know, because then I had to immediately start working on the animated stuff again. And then so uh, I didn't really get to process uh, the list at all. You know, it was kind of like at the bottom of my priorities. But now, obviously, thinking back to it, I'm like, oh, that's really crazy. <laughs> you don't get into the top of the nifty 50 without uh, having your head down, getting the work done. So, <laughs> I, yeah, apparently that's the requirement. So, <laughs> One of the things that I love about um, what Alf and I get to do interviewing different people is we we have a wide gamut, right? So we're not overly, we have our own preferences, what coins and stuff that we like, but we like interviewing people who are part of different projects, different things. And, and one of the most interesting things is that NFTs have come up a lot this year because it's one of the big stories, I think, of, of this bull run. And yeah. we've had people who are like, so convicted with, you know, just NFTs are the future. It's going to be part of the metaverse. It's so important. And then you get people who are saying this is an irrational bubble that, you know, like all that kind of thing, the whole perspective. And each person gives their reason on that. I I know you're very pro NFT, but just in general, I mean, what, what are your holistic thoughts around the space right now? Because there is on the one hand, a lot of opportunity, but there is a lot of money being pumped in and, and probably some people getting in with the hopes of just like you and, and us were getting in with the altcoins, I guess, trying to make some quick financial gain. There's probably a little bit of that going on as well. But what are your thoughts just on the space in general? I mean, I think the te- technology is obviously revolutionary. Um, you know, previously, uh in the real world, everything sort of is more scarce. And then, um, you know, in the digital world, before NFTs, things were very abundant, right? Copy and paste. Uh, But it's similar to, you know, recently I was on Bloomberg and then they were kind of grilling me on this. They were like, well, yeah, so if you can copy and paste, for example, like if Pleaser Doubt bought the Doge meme, um, you know, what's stopping like anybody else from posting the Doge or, you know, why? And then I said, "Um, it's a social construct right like everybody who's sort of like witnessed and 
agree that NFTs are a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously not to mention, you know, it actually, you know, being in scripted on the blockchain and everything, but just everybody witnessing, for example, the, the dog owner, you know, of the image, um, putting the NFT on auction at Zora. And then, you know, there was this whole bidding war that happened. And then ultimately, um, please or DAO's wallet address is the one that owns um, the NFT token is kind of like the same thing as, you know, we could go to France and then there could be some rando small, small art gallery that printed out the Mona Lisa and displayed it, but nobody's going to go there and say, that's the real Mona Lisa because we all have witnessed and collectively understand and agree that the Louvre holds the real Mona Lisa. So it's really essentially the same thing and just translating that onto the digital world, which previously didn't have this kind of construct, right? And then, you know, it's sort of like a way to like prove and show and, you know, it's like a digital signature or it's just like stamp of this is what everybody witnessed happened, you know, and that it can't be changed. And this is, I think people yeah, really underestimate how revolutionary it is. Like NFTs basically capture the value of like vague, arbitrary, um, goods. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. um, yeah. So it's just, you know, like, I don't know, even something like social status or, you know, like flexing and everything is, um, now made possible on the blockchain, uh, because we all agree that this is sort of like the standard, you know, if somebody came and um, invented a new thing and then magically everybody woke up tomorrow and said, that's now the new standard, then that totally works too. But currently it just so happens to be that NFTs, um, you know, especially mostly on Ethereum are what people agree uh, to have value. And this is what sort of proves ownership and everything. And so um, that alone is going to be a game changer. And it's not just, doesn't just apply to art or visual art, but, you know, like in-game assets, uh, even, I don't know, something like movie ticket or, you know, proof of attendance, all this kind of stuff is just going to use this technology. And so, you know, it's not like a bubble or, I mean, you know, prices change, but that's all speculation, but this applies to, you know, tokens as well. And even stocks. Um, but I think it's just the, re the revolutionary part is the technology itself, of course. Yeah. One of my favorite recent examples, and not to throw him under the bus, but I think it was Peter McCormick maybe posted something about like, oh, I copied this JPEG. And then everyone copied his profile picture and they're like, oh, I'm Peter McCormick now kind of thing. And I was like, <laughs> that's like a clever, like, <laughs> I don't know. I thought that was pretty good. But yeah, yeah. I think though, like the, to the point about NFTs on the flip side, because I don't, I, I mean, maybe some people do argue the technology behind nfts is i don't know maybe meaningless or something i don't know if there are lots of those people i think for the most part people see the value in the technology and the um you know the potential that it brings for so many different applications um but to wade's point about are we you know are we in some sort of bubble or something and the speculation part of it i think that part is you know arguably that that's the crazy aspect about the NFT craze right now, which is rocks are selling and did, did JPEGs of rocks are selling for crazy amounts of ETH. And, and when you look at, um, you know, these art projects that are blowing up, I mean, are they blowing up because there is intrinsic value that people feel? And as you said, it's a social construct. Is that why they're worth something or is it worth something just because of the social construct around the speculation that I can buy this and make some money on it, right? Like, and I, and I guess that's pre that that's probably um, true in, with art in general in some cases. But uh, you know, maybe that's a, a different talking point about is the art going to hold value? Is it you know is it actually something people care about? And there is in lots of situations, but I don't think there is in a lot of them. Not today, at least. Sure. I, I mean, I agree with this. You know, none of us are fortune tellers. So it's not like any of us, first of all, ever even thought that Ether Rocks would have a comeback or even, you know, it's just all of this, of course, <laughs> it's speculative or subjective. And uh, because it's being dictated by humans, right? And humans by nature are unpredictable. So it's really hard to say what's going to happen in the future. But I don't know, even 
when you're investing in art or something, let's say you want a people pleaser piece, you know, if you, for example, just like believe in like people pleasers, like career trajectory, then by nature, you say, I think the investment part is thinking, oh, she's probably going to be, you know, way bigger um, than she is right now, maybe three years into the future. Mm. Um, so I would say, you know, that kind of, um, you know, and then obviously that's why so, so many people are so bullish on crypto punks because they are technically, you know, the first sort of like NFTs uh, project to exist. And then that's where, you know, the value lies. And then I think when Pleaser DAO uh, collect their pieces, they're sort of using, applying that same logic or, you know, things that have like provenance or historical significance. Um, so, yeah. But before we get into the last section, because every interview we ask every yes, the same three questions to kind of wrap up our shows. But before we get to that, uh, people pleaser, you've had such a big year. We've talked a lot about it, but just in general, what is what would your advice be to aspiring artists? Because I think that there's probably a lot of people who are in a similar state to maybe where you were a year ago of, you know, it's difficult. You, you mentioned in general, the industry, it's difficult to get a job maybe with certain animation companies and that kind of thing, or just in general, you know, they're, they're in between opportunities. What's your advice to those people who are maybe watching this episode? Um, oh, I actually get obviously a lot of DMs from artists saying, how do I be like you? And, you know, I'm going to first put out the disclaimer that I, um, you know, people might think I'm talented and stuff, but, you know, I'm not, there's so many talented artists out there. I am just extremely lucky. Like I am somebody who just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And, you know, I captured, let's say, I think a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, for this concept of like, oh, if you're a celebrity in the regular world, that doesn't translate one to one um, into NFTs, right? Like you could have like 2 million followers on Instagram, but that doesn't mean that if you drop an NFT, it's going to sell for a lot. Uh, because for example, probably most of their fans aren't crypto native. And so, you know, a lot of people sort of like need to understand that. And then I just happened to have captured a fan base that were already crypto native and mm -hmm. possibly people who bought Ethereum at pre-sale or something and still think, oh, 10 Ethereum is not that much money, <laughs> right. you know? So um, I'm definitely really lucky. It's a combination of extreme luck, um, a lot of hard work, of course, and some calculations, you know, uh, obviously I was just enjoying doing the DeFi animation um, and because I could also learn about investing myself. Uh, but it was definitely a calculated move around March when, when I saw all this stuff blowing up with NFTs and then I was getting a little bit of NFT FOMO. And I thought that there might be a chance that I could hit two birds with one stone with this Uniswap thing, which is why I brought up to them, can I also drop this as an NFT? Because, you know, I thought that, you know, if it did make an impactful sale, then that would also sort of permeate my reputation, which was mainly contained around crypto and DeFi at the time and uh, permeate over to the NFT space, which, you know, back in March, they were still pretty separate, I would say. Like now it's sort of merging more and more together. And so my advice is just to be sharp and, you know, be alert about what's happening in the space and do a lot of reading, you know, be like a sponge, absorb information make calculated moves. Um, yeah, be strategic about things, you know, don't just drop art whenever and stuff and uh, make sure you have a good story to tell as well. I think, you know, good storytelling uh, goes a long way to remove a lot of wrongs and probably part of why people sort of like follow my journey is also because um, of my story, right? And so um, my advice is just to show yourself on Twitter, um, do research, you know, be sort of like sharp and aware of things and also be lucky. <laughs> All right. So we're talking about your story. Uh, and we've gone over a lot today where you started, how you got to where you are today. You've given some advice. But what does the story look like for people pleaser going into the future? Mm -hmm. What does the future hold for you? You know, I just hope that I continue to my, on my mission with each new collaboration to either fight for a value that I really stand for or elevate uh, the community as a whole, accelerate positivity in the space. And I mean, it's a, been a wild ride so far. It's, you know, every day something new and different happens. So it's hard to say where this 
boat is taking me, but yeah, I'm along for the ride. And just so, so sort of those three things that I mentioned before are like my guiding, you know, North star in what I do. Have the opportunities been flooding toward you though? Like, like, is it ever since like fortune and the V3, like, is it just increasing all the time? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, I, I need to, I probably need to hire an assistant or something. Just, <laughs> yeah it's really hard to deal with all this inbound um, and something that I've been sort of like learning as well. It's a learning process for me, especially because it happened so fast, but yes, there's a lot of inbound and I'm sorry to anybody who I might've (laughs) ignored your messages on Twitter or something. It's just, I'm one person. It's really difficult to stay on top of things really. And I never do it on purpose. So (laughs) we are selfishly really happy that you're, name is people pleaser and that is your attitude because that meant you said yes to this show and it's yeah. been an awesome conversation so far but as i mentioned before people pleaser we like to end every episode of show me the crypto with the same three question segment we call it you had me at crypto and alf is going to ask you those questions okay you ready yeah all right first question here who is your favorite person to follow in the crypto space oh that's a tough one Honestly, probably inverse bra. <laughs> I mean, look, the account itself just captures all of like the funny tweets that are happening. <laughs> so nice. love it. Uh second question. What will the price of Bitcoin be 10 years from now? Now, I don't know. It's hard to say. I want to say somewhere between the 50 to 100 K range. Interesting. 10 years from now. That's the lowest That's answer the lowest that we've, we've had, had so far. I love it. Though. You know what? I don't know. People might accuse me of being an ETH max or something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, you know what? I think um, there's there's quite the gamut of, of predictions that we've had. And the truth is nobody knows. Nobody it's just knows, a fun yeah. guess. But I like that because that's something I hold, different. I hold Bitcoin myself too, you know, so of course yeah. I hope it goes high. <laughs> yeah. Nice. All right. Uh, third question. What's the most underrated coin or project in all of crypto? Currently? Mm, I don't know about underrated, but, um, you know, honestly, I really love the, um, it's, it's this project, like an NFT project it's called Proof of Beauty. And, you know, even during this NFT boom and everything, it hasn't picked up a lot of you know, like, you know, as much traction as maybe other products, but I think it's so cool. It's basically a project um, that takes sort of like TXs, um, you know, on blockchain, and then it generates like a generative piece of art um, based on that. And so, you know, for example, like historical moments, like, you know, people were taking like the TX of when either my Uniswap auction was settled or like when I minted the piece or something, and then it creates a piece of art and they actually look really cool too. So, you know, if you imagine like printing that out and like having it in your house and then if people come and they're like, oh, what's the meaning behind this work? And then, you know, if you explain that to them, I think that's so cool. So I think that's like one of the most underrated projects right now. That sounds so cool. I'm definitely going to check that out. Well, people pleaser, like we said, this has been a real honor. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Show Me the Crypto. Ah, thank you. Thank you for listening to Show Me the Crypto. Please make sure to subscribe as well as rate and review this podcast.